And I think we are ready to get started. It's 2 o'clock on my Android phone, so uh, time has come. So, hey everyone, my name is Alexander Gargenta. I also go by nickname of Sasha. And um, we'll be doing a talk on the, what Marco branded is the black magic of Android services. Uh, which is basically a fancy way of saying we're going to be talking about some of the kind of interesting verticals that exist in Android. We call them services, but they involve a lot more. Um, and you'll see that, you know, we will obviously won't have to have the time to cover all 60 plus of them, uh, at least as that's how many I count in my Nexus, uh, Galaxy Nexus. But we'll cover some of the more interesting ones just to give you a taste of how they're put together to give you an idea of the, the kind of the, the flow, if you will, of data as well as control all the way from the top of the stack, so the app layer, down to the kernel in a lot of cases. Um, I only have about 10 services that I'll actually go over. Um, and these, as you will see, are very much described in form of diagrams, some of which may be hard to read if you're sitting in the back. And there are some open seats up front, so here's your chance to uh, Take advantage of the seats if you want to be able to read uh, what's, uh, what's in the diagrams. Anyway, just to, uh, I guess, introduce myself, um, I uh, uh, work at a company called Maracana. I uh, help deliver and uh, develop training courses on, among other things, Android internals, Android security, and the like. I happen to, uh, I founded and, and I co-organized the San Francisco Android User Group. Uh, so we uh, meet every month. You guys should, uh, if you're local, come and check out some of our events. They're free and very educational. I also run the Java user group. Um, I co-run the HTML5 user group. I tend to speak at events like this. I, um, I've been doing, actually, I started my career mostly on the server side, Java on Linux, so a lot of Linux administration along the way, um, but then moved into kind of that that's I guess I, wish, I don't want to say desktop, but client side, so Android, embedded systems, and the like. Um, I've worked in other mobile technologies, like WAP push, MMS, proxies, that sort of stuff, you know, long, long, long time ago. Um, the company I work for uh, focuses on open source software. Uh, specifically, one large part of that is Android, and we provide training, we publish content, we record uh, videos, uh, tutorials, all, all of it, most of it is actually available for free on our website. Um, and uh, we help um, uh, sponsor and uh, run different communities, organize different communities around the technologies that we're passionate about. So I'm pretty sure, actually, let's just by a show of hands, how many of you have never seen a picture that looks like this? <laughs> okay, cool. So. That means you came to the right place. So we're not going to be talking about the stack. We're going to be talking about essentially the you know intersections through the stack. So think of it as a you know way of going you know from the top of the stack down through the application framework through the native layer uh, to the Linux kernel. Um, and we'll be discussing some of the services along the way. As I mentioned, we'll be looking at um, only about ten out of the you know sixty plus plus services. Uh, but the idea is to get a taste of how they're put together, how they're similar in many ways in terms of the communication, but also how they're different and, and why they're different. Um, that said, I do want to point out that there are, or there are actually, in fact, there's going to be an interesting talk on the camera hall uh, after this one. Uh, uh, folks from Optina that are sitting in the back are going to be talking uh, about it right here. Um, and uh, there were actually a couple of interesting talks already on sensors, audio and a few other things. So by all means, you know, there are definitely complementary talks with this one. In fact, there may be some redundancy to, for example, what uh, Benjamin talked about here last night, if any of you actually sat in this room. Um, that said, hopefully it will still be interesting and, uh, well, entertaining. So, whoops, hold on. That's not what I meant to click on. Um, so that said, Hopefully, by the way, one thing I just want to point out from, from this picture, um, I hope that you, most of you are familiar with the idea that applications um, essentially run in separate processes, uh, that they communicate to services mostly through binder. Um, binder is this IPC mechanism that Android uh, provides um, in form of a, a kind of a kernel driver. We'll mention it briefly on the next slides, kind of how it works. Um, the services do talk to each other, most of which run inside of this system server process. Others may run in other processes, like for example, the media server, which we'll touch upon later on. Um, 
they, among themselves, talk sometimes through simple Java calls, most of which are actually written in Java, some, some of which are written in actually C, C++. Um, but when it comes to the native layer, and by native layer I mean, you know, the, the, the user space call, I mean the, um, the different kind of, uh, um, say, stage fright uh, or the plugins that Android provides uh, for different, for example, media codecs, uh, the different daemons and so on and so on. Most of the communication between the Java layer and that is uh, through the uh, JNI, although in some cases there's actually, the communication can also be done through Binder and can also be done through Unix sockets, and we'll touch upon those as well. Um, and then finally, the kind of to go from the native layer down into the Linux kernel and actually access the drivers, that's essentially, you guys probably know, you know, given that you're here at this conference uh, about that already, but, you know, there are obviously uh, uh, different APIs from system calls to, you know, in interacting with the drivers through IOCTLs, through Netlink, through, you know, simple reads and writes, and so on and so on. So we'll touch upon essentially, like I said, different services and take a look at how they crisscross through this, through this stack. So let's start off with something that's kind of easy. Um, you know, whoops, the vibrator service. Um, they say it's easy because it doesn't involve as many moving parts, okay? Um, and of course, this is the vanilla ARSP implementation. This may differ um, to what you have on your device, especially, for example, uh, there are companies that specialize in providing haptic, um, you know, better haptic implementation in form of both software and hardware, uh, which actually AOSP does not embrace because it's not, it's closed sourced. Um, and so this actually is kind of what the vibrator stack, if you will, or the flow looks like on a Galaxy Nexus device. In fact, most of these slides are geared towards Galaxy Nexus and Ice Cream Sandwich. So let's, let's kind of just Take a look at this. Um, here what we have is two different processes, one being this example application on the left and this system server on the right. And then down below, as you see, we have a kernel with a couple of, you know, two drivers exposed to us. Now, um, ultimately, this application wants to vibrate the device. What, you know, maybe it's because of notification, although in that case, if we're going through a different, it wouldn't do it directly, it would actually go through a notification service. But let's assume it wants to vibrate the device for whatever reason, some provides some haptic, haptic like feedback. Um, before we can actually talk about you know, the application, we actually have to jump on the right hand side to talk about the system server. But before we talk about the system server, we have to talk about the the, the service manager, and by, you know, while we're there, we might as well talk about the boot up. So, at, you know, when the Android device boots up, we know that, you know, we initialize the kernel, we load the kernel, kernel executes this init process, init process parses these init RC files, which hopefully you guys know about. If you don't, you know, go and see Benjamin's talk from yesterday when it's published. And init RC, among other things, launches this service manager, which is this box right here, okay? And I apologize for all the lines. It's actually going to get uglier than this, but I'll try to draw attention to the different things. And don't worry about trying to read everything. I'll explain it along the way. Um, the service manager is a daemon that basically is tracked by init. So should it exit, it, should, you know, it would automatically be restarted, for example. And one of the things that it does, it actually goes and registers with the binder as the context manager. Basically, it registers itself as this uh, uh, a binder uh, um, a service at, at position zero, which is a special position. Um, and the, the reason for that is so that others can find the service manager. Now, service manager's job is to essentially act as a registry of all the other services. So as you will see, you know, for us to actually be able to talk to some other service, and this talk is about services, we have to find that service in the first place, and for us to find it, we have to Talk, you know, talk to something that has a reference to the service. Ultimately, a, a reference is nothing more than a kind of a logical name, which is, think of it as a string, right? A, you know, byte, a, a character a buffer, and some sort of an ID, an integer that uniquely identifies a particular process and in that process a particular service in that process that Binder knows about. So, Service Manager is in fact a service in, its, in, in itself because it acts as a service to others that actually need to query other services. So it registers as the context manager. 
Now, one interesting thing about the service manager is that you, you know, our, our applications can't randomly register services with the service manager. Um, one of the things the service manager does, it implements a security check, which is kind of hard-coded, and it checks whether whoever's doing the registration is one of the trusted UIDs. System, system, the system user is actually one of the trusted UIDs. So that's why, you know, this is... The services you get from the service manager are somewhat to be trusted. Although, you know, if you were to attend the SE Linux talk or SE Android talk happening concurrently, you know, you may hear otherwise. Anyway, service manager gets launched um, and essentially, you know, it becomes available to everyone because it's at this known location. After that, the Zygote starts up, which hopefully you know is this how big Dalvik instance, if you will, that listens on, on a Unix socket and, and, and forks itself to start your applications. But before it does that, it actually forks itself to start this big process called the system server. Um, system server is run by the system user, which you know, has capabilities of talking to the service manager. Now, one of the things the system server does, it actually goes and executes this system server Java you know, uh, uh, class, because it runs a main method. That main method goes and loads some native libraries, initializes, registers a few, essentially, uh, JNI libraries, if you will, with the JNI uh, environment, and then starts bringing up or, or booting services. Like I said, there's 60 plus services, not all of which are coming from here, but most of which are. So one of the services that it registers in this case, that it actually instantiates, so it creates, that's kind of what this means, so it's kind of hard to see, but um, it uh, builds a vibrator service. Now, vibrator service happens to implement a iVibrator AIDL, which turns out to be an interface in Java, where it, you know, it gets compiled into essentially an interface, um, and particularly implements a stub. We'll talk about how this comes into play. Okay? Um, then the vibrator service, once instantiated, be, gets a registered. That's where this, well, I guess it's card again. For some reason, it can't actually select it. So let me do it this other way. So registers this service with the service manager. Now the service manager knows about this service that got instantiated by the, by the service, uh, the system server. Um, and that's it. Now the system server boots other services and at the end, at the end of the day goes and you know, tells the activity manager service, hey, we're done. The activity manager service goes and sends out that boot completed event and sends out another intent to launch the, you know, the, the, the launcher and now our system is booted. Now, now our application starts up, assuming the user started, started it. And here we go. That's the application, the example app.apk. That application, you know, let's assume has some sort of example activity. That activity actually wants to vibrate the device. So what it would do, it would instantiate this uh, android.os.vibrator. Um, in, in some cases, you actually use the context to get system services. In some cases, you instantiate and there's different. In some cases, you just say context.get. Package manager, for example, which is also system service. So it's not very consistent. Depends on on what are we, you know, uh, on different services. In this case, actually, you don't have instantiated. You you do use the context that get system service. You after you get a vibrator, um, you call a public method on, method on it to to vibrate the device. Now. The vibrator's job is, as you will see, just to proxy our call to vibrator device to this vibrator service, which is sitting over here. So vibrator itself could have been actually called vibrator manager. A lot of services are actually split into two parts, the manager and the service. The manager acts essentially as a, as a proxy to shield you as the developer from knowing that there's binder calls happening in the background. Okay. So what this does, it actually goes, the vibrator goes and gets a reference to the service manager by asking for, you know, whatever is at handle zero, which is the context manager. And that's how it learns about this service manager, the, the thing that we already discussed. Um, it then goes, and again, how does it know that is because it goes to binder and binder itself references the service manager because it knows what's at position zero. So you can give it that information. Um, then what we do is we go and ask the service manager over here to tell us, to, to give us something of, by name, vibrator. This is, this is just a string, nothing more than that. And essentially what that gives us is a reference to this service that we previously talked about. Okay? Um, now, we don't actually get a real reference. We get an ID of that service which behind the scenes, we can kind of think of it as a reference. We then go and ask this iVibrator stub 
to actually give us this as a proxy. And we now have something that looks like iVibrator service to use. Now, when I say we, I don't mean our application. I mean this vibrator, you know, which is essentially a proxy. So that's how we get this. Now we're ready to find a new vibrator device. So we say, you know, this service that vibrates, that goes and essentially makes a call to binder. That's what this uses means or calls, binder. And says, execute this transaction by some ID and execute such and such method by some ID. Every method of every essentially service has a particular ID. It's not important to know, but that's kind of how it works on the covers. And it also passes, like for example, information how long to vibrate the device. Now the binder essentially delivers that over here to this vibrator service. Now, the vibrator service, one thing that's interesting is that it extends this stub. Now this stub is something that was created automatically by that AIDL tool. If any of you know what that is, great. If you don't, essentially AIDL is an interface, you know, Android interface definition language, which is used to describe these services to their clients. And so um, this tool can generate these proxies and stubs that, that help with marshalling data across this binder channel, if you will, so that we don't have to deal with low level, you know, how do we convert some rich Java data types, for example, into these parcels, which are the objects that we can send over the binder wire to the other side, and then how does the other side demarshal them into back into Java objects that it can use, or Java data types. In C, by the way, we don't get that. So if you implement services in C++, as we will see later on, you end up having to do this by hand, this marshalling and unmarshalling. Whereas here, the ideal tool essentially generates these stubs and proxies and makes this trivial. So ultimately, this service or this stub has a transact or on transact method. That's what get the binder calls. Binder also, by the way, manages all these threading and so on and so on in the background. So every Every process in Android has essentially a thread pool which, uh, through which it gets, uh, uh, from where it gets, grabs a thread to actually service these remote requests. And so finally, this stub, all it does, it, it, it captures that on transact, on, on transact request, figures out which actual method to invoke, and then calls that method on the vibrator service. So in reality, you can kind of think of this transaction as going to the stub, which calls the service. But because they're one and the same at runtime, it's one object, you know, they essentially live in the same memory space, if you will. So this service, at this point, one of the things that it does, and this is actually why we need services in most cases, is that A, it checks for whether the caller has the permission to actually, in this case, vibrate the device. So, uh, you know, one, one, one could argue, why would we, you know, have to go through this entire elaborate, you know, go and talk to some other process to vibrate the device, why don't we just talk to the driver ourselves? And so, in a lot of cases, this has to do with security. And so the services is, uh, provide the, the essentially that gateway that, that enforce security uh, uh, permissions for us. And two, it also acts as a mutual exclusion point because you don't want multiple applications vibrating the device at the very same time with different, for example, patterns that would work very well. So, for example, a lot of these services synchronize, if you will, because they're stateful. In the synchronized blocks, they allow these requests to continue. So the vibrator service, the first thing that it does Go ahead. Yeah, and, and they also, um, uh, and, and you're completely right about that, and they also provide <coughs> essentially persistent state throughout the life cycle of the system so that the system behaves properly, you know, the vibrator, you know, needs to work coherently across hundreds of processes and the same thing with the other systems. That's right. So, so we basically, we, there's a lot of code in Android written with an assumption that these services are there and they're always going to be there. So, so uh, and, and in some cases there's state that's important, in some cases there potentially isn't. Like, so for example, location manager service will remember what was the last known location. Is for vibrator, that's not that big of a deal. The state here is like, is there someone else already vibrating the device? That's the state in this case. Anyway, the, let me just mention this and I'll get to your question. The question is how, a question I'd like to answer, I don't know if anyone wants to ask it, is how does, how does the vibrator service know whether or not we have a permission to vibrate the device? And so the way this works is that binder, one of the things that it does, it passes, at a time you evoke a binder transaction from process to process, it passes the UID and the PID of the calling process to the process being called. 
And so this service can just say, what is the remote UID and PID? Now, once you have a UID, the user identifier, and in Android, every application gets a unique UID that, that persists for the lifetime of that application on the device. Once we have a UID, we can actually ask the package manager, which is another service, to give us, to tell us everything we know about the, that application, including, for example, which permissions it holds or uses. Once we know which permissions it uses, we can basically know, we can, you know, on that list, is there a permission that, you know, that we want to enforce? Now, all of this is actually, you know, shielded away from us from these, you know, by these little helper methods. But ultimately, every service, in a very trivial way, can ask, does the calling process hold a particular permission? And if it doesn't, it can simply throw a security exception. So that's, again, one of the reasons why we have services. So that's what the first thing that the vibrant service does. And then it goes and basically, you know, in a synchronized block, goes and says, okay, now I'm going to vibrate the device. Now, the other thing that the vibrant service does compared to just talking to a normal, you know, in this case, a, a, you know, a GPI or driver, is that it, we could, you know, it also provides more features. Like, for example, it can implement pattern vibrations. So we don't have to actually do it ourselves. Like if you want to vibrate for a little bit, then not, and then vibrate again. You know, we don't do it ourselves. We actually go and give it an array of, you know, longs, which, you know, provide our timings, and it goes and implements that behavior for us. So kind of to provide a haptic feedback, not just a simple, stupid vibration. It's on, off, and done. So anyways, there's more value to services, as you will see, than just simply wrapping the drivers. So Assuming we have the permission, assuming we, you know, enter the synchronized block, what then the vibrant service does is calls a native method. And a lot of these services actually, parts, parts of their implementation are built natively. And so native, when you say a method in Java is native, essentially that means is that it's implemented in JNI. Right? Now, for those of you that don't know, JNI stands for Java Native Interface. It's a way of Java code essentially linking to native methods or functions, I should say, that are implemented in C or C++. And then, so when somebody goes and invokes a native method in Java, that actually goes and mar marshals that Java data, Java data types, into C data types, you know, that are, you know, somehow mapped properly. And then, you know, the C code or, in, let's say, C++ code goes and executes. Um, here it says that it's C++, but really this is not object-oriented. In this case, it's really nothing more than a simple, you know, using C++ just for namespacing. Um, so the actual implementation or, you know, the next step happens inside of this vibrator service.cpp. Now, this service comes from a library called libandroidservers.so, which is actually loaded ahead of time by the system server on boot. So one of the things, the first thing that the system server does is that it loads this uh, uh, Android servers uh, .so file. Now, this library is actually compiled, and just, uh, just one thing I wanted to mention, I don't know if it was obvious, this box represents the Java world, right? So or the Dalvik world, I should say. So all of this so far has been happening in Dalvik. Now we escape the Dalvik boundary. We're still in the same process. We now essentially execute a function in this service. Now that, that function, all that it does, it actually executes or looks for a how component, specifically the vibrator how. Now, I hope that most of you are familiar with this idea of how, but if you're not, let me just quickly mention it. So in Android, we have multiple forms of how, the hardware abstraction layers. I mean, the kernel itself, through the form of drivers, essentially provides how. But now we have also a user space hall. The reason why we need it, there are two reasons why we need it at least, is one, we want to provide consistent APIs to the top of the platform, to the top layers of the stack, so that we can build these, these services you know, you know, in the same similar way and port them from system to system to system with not actually not knowing or having to worry about the actual drivers that may be used underneath the covers. So that's, that's the main reason why we... Uh, we basically, uh, you know, we need HAL. The other reason is, um, you know, the, the kernel code or the kernel HAL, stuff that goes into a kernel is, you know, should be GPL'd. Um, of course, there's different, you know, some people tend to interpret that differently. Um, but if you want to keep your secrets out secret and you don't want to release your code under GPL, um, Android actually works very hard to make that possible. So everything in Android, with a few exceptions, is licensed under, you know, the business-friendly, quote-unquote, license like you know, a Apache or MIT or BSD license. So the entire, for example, Bionic Libc libraries license that they're not LGPL, but rather as, uh, as uh, BSD. So point being is 
this, these call components in Android can remain proprietary if you, as, a, as an OEM, want to keep them that way. Um, finally, now in this particular case, this vibrator C actually implements a vibrator.h file, which comes from this lib hardware legacy um, in, you know, uh, include, if you will, uh, directory, and there's a, you know, a vibrator that age. And so this just does a simple, um, you know, call to, in this case, a driver exposed through SysFS by literally, you know, saying, okay, writes a particular, you know, uh, long, which is how long it should go and, and turn on the vibration for, and then, you know, it writes say, you know, now you should power it off. So literally, this is just writing to a driver through simple I.O., nothing fancy, you know, to turn on the vibrator or turn off. Now, of course, there's better ways of doing this, but unfortunately, um, vibrations, you know, the whole haptic, you know, the world of haptic feedback is, is riddled with patents, and so this is what AOSP can provide out of the box without running into any sort of issues there. But ultimately, that's, that's what the vibrator looks like. Okay, now I know you had a question. Did I answer your question, or? Yes, you did. I was just wondering about permission to be the deaf audio. Okay, so I, I did guess your question. Any other questions? Yeah, could you comment on uh, the use of thread pools? So, so it's the, the thread pools for the system server, thread pools for the binder? Uh, system server in particular. Uh, obviously, the vibrator is going to take a long time to execute and you need the multiple threads, multiple processes. Yeah, so, so, and this is different from service to service. Um, ultimately, a lot of calls to binder, for example, can be implemented through nothing more than, you know, like one, those, one of those one way. Uh, calls in which case the client doesn't actually wait for for the completion, um, and the thread the thread pooling is then the binder side is done automatically. So so the kernel automatically or the driver manages that. Now the system server itself, different services inside the system server have their own threads. So for example, the vibrator, especially if you give it some sort of a pattern to vibrate on, what it does it actually builds a thread. Or thread pool and executes the vibration on that pattern in that separate thread independently of anything else happening. Um, so, so oh now the system server process this this guy also has you know for example start services in a different thread to allow the rest of the system code to boot up concurrently. Um, but there isn't a you know a thread pool for the entire system server. It's more like there are thread pools for individual services or better yet different calls are in, in run. Through, through threads that are owned by those particular services. And it's again, you know, so, so, so in some cases it's somewhat redundant because you could just, you know, tie up the thread from the binder and just execute everything in there. Or in this case of the vibration, for example, it does manage its own thread. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, through from, say it again. Oh, to the service manager. So how does that, how does this work? So so when the system server goes over here to talk to the service manager, no, it actually so so the system server and this is kind of hard to see. And again, there are too many lines, and at some point you'll see that I gave up on lines. But uh, the system server actually uses a service manager Java class to say get a service by a particular name. Now that class, what it does, it actually jumps into the JNI again over JNI to the to the lib binder. Lib binder actually goes and asks the, the slash dev slash binder for 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 a service at position zero. And then you know, it uses that actually creates a handle if you will to something at position zero. Um, and then anytime it wants to, for example, ask for a service, like in this case over here, you can see it's asking for a service called, you know, vibrator. So this, that, that kind of line, it already knows how to get to it. And it's essentially talking to the driver. And it's, it's talking to the driver by memory mapping slash dev slash binder, passing in a, per, you know, a particular area of it, passing a particular request at a, at a, you know, for whatever, something by a particular name and getting, uh, um, or sorry. In this case, it's talking to the service manager, but it's talking to it through binder as well. So no, there are no Unix sockets in this case used for anything. Okay, so this is again one of the simpler ones. Um, let's take a look at something a little more complicated, if you will, um, the power or the power management. 
So I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you here are familiar uh, uh, with wake locks. Um, if not from you using wake locks, but you know maybe from you disliking wake locks for one or other reasons. So anyway, um, in Android we use wake locks to prevent the device from essentially eagerly going into this suspense state to conserve power. Um, but the question is, how does that work? So in this case, we have, an, uh, you know, again, on the right-hand side, sorry, on the right-hand side, we have a system server, which again, you know, has a system server Java class, which in this case creates a power manager service. Power manager service, uh, uh, what it does, and by the, again, this is just simple, you know, new, so that's why it creates it. The power manager service basically gets registered with the service manager, again, using, you know, power, so quote unquote power as as a name. Um, that's how the service manager you know remembers it. Also, power manager service service links with this power.cpp, which we'll see later on. Uh, you know, so so it provides some functionality. Okay, and now we are you know that's this is the system server part. That's kind of the booting process. Let's say we have an application that wants to use a wake lock. So what it does, it has an activity that, and it now wants to grab a wake lock. In that activity, it gets a reference to the power manager. Uh, and again, it gets a reference to the power manager usually through the context um, by saying, you know, context.get system, uh, system server, sorry, system service, puts in quotes, uh, power, and essentially gets a reference to the, to the power manager. Now, again, this is what that, you know, that's, um, sorry. Um, that's what that, that that's what it gives us this. Now, the power manager, what it does, it acts as a factory for these wake locks. Wake locks are objects that are built from the power manager. Now, what, what it does is that it gives those wake locks over to the activity. The reason why it provides these objects as wake locks is because wake locks are stateful. They need to know what they are so that you can acquire them and later on you can release them. And the state is in the wake lock. Essentially, it's a, it's a kind of a unique ID, if you will, or a name or a tag. Um, so the wake lock is given back to the activity. Activity will at some point go and say wake lock dot acquire. Okay? And this doesn't have to be activity. It could be you know, a service or something other than that. So it acquires the wake lock. Now, the, the acquire actually goes to the power manager stub, which is a, or a proxy, I should say, which again, we get a, re a reference to by going to the service manager. Okay? What it, so it's essentially, when you, this, this reference, this proxy, is really referencing this guy over here. Of course, we can't go to it directly. We have to go through it to bind it. Okay, so, so we don't actually, the power manager in this case itself is, or I should say, this power manager is useless after we get a, uh, get a wake lock. Uh, the actual communication with the power manager service is through the wake lock, no, no longer through the power manager. So after we say, uh, you know, acquire or release later on, it again, through a proxy, goes to the binder, again, binder issues a transaction on this power manager service. Power manager service is essentially tied or in extends from this stub. That stub provides one of those on transact methods, which is what binder actually invokes. That stub goes and then demarshals the request into something that the power manager service implemented in Java knows. And then the power manager service now actually goes and say, say wants to acquire a wake lock. It goes and calls a native method, which now comes from this power.cpp file. Again, it's implemented through JNI. And then this, again, goes and executes a how, uh, essentially, function, which is acquired the wake lock, which is implemented in this power.c. Now, power.c is actually part of this lib hardware legacy.so. It could be implemented elsewhere, but that's essentially what this, you know, by default uses to, to load it. Um, what this does, it does nothing more than a simple write. Again, simple IO write to, in this case, sys, wake lock, sorry, sys power wake lock and passes the tag name as well as potential, you know, um, expiry if you're, you're asking for a wake lock to auto expire. Later on, when you want to release the wake lock, it does exactly the same thing, except that it goes again all the way down here and it talks to wake unlock to basically unlock that service or unlock that, that wake lock. Yeah, well, I think when I remember digging through the power manager service code, uh, it's a, instead of mapping all the calls onto kernel wake locks, the power manager service actually maintains all the user space wake locks, and then there's a single wake lock called 
the power manager service, which it grabs on the kernel and releases if there's no wake loss that user space had requested. So it basically multiplexes all the user space ones onto a single kernel. And it's it's possible that that's, I'm not going to say that's not the, that is what's going on. Um, I've actually not, um, I, I should, should have double checked this for ICS. Um, either way, whether whether essentially the power manager, as you said, multiplexes you know the wake logs. Ultimately, it's going to go to that driver. Whether it's going to use a shared wake log or whether it's going to use you know a, a app specific wake log. Point being is though that this wake log over here is referenced as a, some sort of state on the side of the power manager service, so that it knows essentially what's currently outstanding. Go ahead. Yeah, for what it's worth, uh, the gentleman's explanation seems to be. Helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I have two questions. First one is um, if the uh, application should fail, how is cleanup accomplished? So, Activity Manager service is also actually aware of the current outstanding, uh, or it's aware of basically applications that hold wake locks. I've not looked specifically into how, it, where it's holding that list, but it does handle that. Um, there may be something else as well that I've not looked into, but uh, I know that a service manager, activity manager service, does have essentially cleanup code as well in there. It's like a binder died. So, so, so that's also a good point. So, um, binder allows you to to basically attach a, a, a callback to pretty much any process, uh, so that if it dies, you can execute you know, random cleanup. But I know that. There's basically more cleanup that can happen even if an application misbehaves, uh, which is not you know it dying. It just basically says goes, goes in a you know stop state and doesn't release a wake log. There's there's some timeouts and, and so on and so on implemented at the activity manager service. Go ahead. Does the um, does wake log tie in any way to the memory filler or resource or activity filler that uh, says hey this process is running away with all my battery life and I'm gonna be more aggressive. Uh, no, a uh, low memory killer d doesn't care about the wake locks. The activity manager service does. And the activity manager service is actually the first line of defense, if you will, in memory management. So it'll, it'll preemptively kill applications. Um, the low memory killer can comes into play when, when it, the activity manager service doesn't actually properly, or, or, or when the applications don't die. So activity manager does monitor. The use of wake locks, among other things. Building. Okay, oh, yeah. so let's move on. I, uh, I do have a quite a few more things to talk about, and the other one around the time. So alarms. So you know, this is how I got you know here this morning uh, by having you know this happen. Um, so I use the desk clock APK, which is a system you know system application to to basically you know schedule an alarm. Um, on the right hand side, again, what do we have? You know, we have a system server, in, uh, in, you know, instantiate this alarm manager service. Alarm manager service is links to this alarm manager service.cpp, uh, which we'll talk about, you know, how, what it does later. This, on the other side, we have the, the desk clock. The desk clock, again, goes and talk, uh, has internally some sort of activity called alarm clock, which uses some sort of, uh, you know, functions, static, a bunch of static functions implemented in this alarms. Alarms actually, uses a context and asks the context for the alarm manager. Context, actually, this context implementation goes down to the binder and figures out, it gives it something by, by name alarm. So now we have the alarm manager. Now the alarm manager is what we invoke. The alarm manager, again, is implemented as a binder service. So this is really uh, what, we, what, we, what we talk to is really a proxy. The proxy goes down to the, to the, to the binder. So then from the binder, we have a call to the alarm manager service. Now we're saying, for example, schedule something to be to be woken up, um, and then the, this go, this goes and invokes a you know alarm manager service you know of native implementation, which uses IOCTLs to talk to the to the driver, which is implemented as slash dev slash alarm. Now there's these lists of things that are scheduled, and then, you know there's management of what's the next thing that essentially needs to wake up the device. We don't we have the time to go into the specifics of how it works, but ultimately that's the that's that's what happens when you schedule a repeating up, you know, repeating wake up or exact wake up in the in the future. So, package manager. This is uh, you know again just to show you a little bit of a difference here. We actually had yet another process. So, let's say you want to install a new application. What happens? So typically you actually send an intent. Uh, to install application, and you pass by URI the location of an APK, which can be an SD card, could be somewhere else. 
Um, and what you're doing is you're essentially launching this package installer. Package installer, you know, inside of it has a package installer activity, which happens to talk to this convenience class called installed app progress, which in turn gets a reference to the application, basically uh, this application package manager. And again, this application package manager is an instance of package manager. Okay? So it actually builds it, instantiates it, it's kind of hard-coded. Um, this uh, package manager, this application package manager, um, essentially, again, talks to the binder, gets a reference to the remote service, which is this package manager service, and now has a proxy. So hopefully you're seeing a pattern here. Right? Um, that, that when we then invoke that proxy uh, transaction method, it goes again to the binder. From binder, it invokes the transaction into the package manager service. How did this get in here? Again, the system server put it in here and registered it with the system uh, service manager. So now we have the package manager service, which we know extends from this stub. Again, that the proxy and the stub can handle the marshalling and the marshalling. So now what, what this does, it talks to this installer, which is you know, just a local, uh, a local, you know, convenience, if you will, you know, object that it's not exposed elsewhere, um, which in turn, actually, what's interesting, talks to this install D, sorry, I should say, it sends messages to install the Unix socket. These messages are read by this install D daemon. Now, why do we need this install D you know, daemon, why do we just not directly install the application? Um, well, the, the reason being is that the system server runs as the system user. And every application when, when, when installed or when created um, needs to be assigned a unique UID and then all the files and directories need to be owned by that UID. So we, we can't change own uh, the, 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 fo the, file, the folders, if you will, the files from the system server. So instead, we have the install D do that work for us. This install D runs as root. And the reason why only we can talk to install D and nobody else is because this basically socket is only readable and writable by the system user and root. So, so that's how we get the directory structure created. Now, of course, there's more work that happens in the background, like the you know the moving of the, the libraries into the, the native libraries in the right place, the running of the uh, DEX optimizations, and so on and so on. We're, don't, we're not going to go into that, but that's kind of the workflow. And what's interesting is there's a helper daemon here being used to 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 augment that workflow. Um, Wi-Fi. So as you can see, it's progressively getting more complicated. Um, Wi-Fi, by Wi-Fi, I mean the Wi-Fi management, not the actual communication through Wi-Fi. So ultimately, what we have is, again, let's say some application that wants to initiate a scan of, you know, local hotspots. Again, we have an activity. Again, we have a manager. Hopefully, again, by now you're seeing the manager is nothing more than a proxy to shield us from knowledge of the binder. The manager actually talks to this proxy, which we obtain by grabbing a reference to this Wi-Fi service. Now, when we invoke a method call on that proxy, that becomes a transaction through binder, so it gets to binder, then from binder, then we, we get into this, you know, Wi-Fi service. Wi-Fi service got in here by the system server, basically creating it and then registering with the service manager. The Wi-Fi service, what it does, it calls it talks to this Wi-Fi state machine. There's this whole management of the state on what's, you know, wh where is the state of the Wi-Fi, whether it's active, inactive, whether it's supposed to be active, whether the driver is loaded, and so on and so on. Because um, the Wi-Fi driver tends to be one that actually can be loaded, unloaded, and reconfigured with different firmware. If you, for example, want to use it in a, a, you know, in a normal mode or in this peer-to-peer -peer or Wi-Fi direct mode. So let's again not get into the details of it, but ultimately. What this is doing is then invoking Wi-Fi native. Wi-Fi native is essentially just a bridge to the C land, which, or C++ if you will, which basically links to this Wi-Fi.cpp. Now, Wi-Fi.cpp actually talks to a HAL component, which again comes from this blip hardware legacy, it's Wi-Fi.c, which by default, and most of the phones, at least my Galaxy Nexus does use it, um, it that's an essential implementation that it uses. One of the things that Wi-Fi.c is responsible for is, for example, loading and unloading the driver into the, into the kernel. Um, on my Nexus S, for example, that does happen. On the Galaxy Nexus, that doesn't happen. It's actually, it's not uh, delivered as a, uh, as a module. Um, but one other thing that it does, let's, let's say 
you want to scan for hotspots or, or you want to initiate like a thing supplicant or, or I don't know, um, connect an initiate a, a connection to a particular network. It basically talks to this WPA client, which comes from uh, the, the external directory. I, you, you may notice that you know, there's this WPA and there's different versions of it, the five, six, and eight. On Galaxy Nexus, for example, uses version eight. This client then sends a message via a Unix socket, again, it gets, you know, I know that these lines crisscross, it looks a little weird, sends a message via a Unix socket to this WPA supplicant. The WPA supplicant is actually what talks to the driver and does the configuration of the driver. Um, now, the way it talks to the driver, it depends on, you know, the, the, the WPA supplicant support different drivers. In this case, on at least the Galaxy Nexus, this is the some Broadcom driver that is essentially, that implements this NL you know, 802211, uh, you know, or 211, so 802211 API. Um, and essentially, that's how the configuration happens. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you've looked at it. Uh, I know the WPA supplicant is the standard one. They have it running some they just moved it over, uh, and they're using that. So do you know how much changes they made to it to make it work with this Android stack, or is it just the plain standard WPA supplicant? There are, I mean, I've not... Uh, so, so, so honestly, I've not used WPA or I've not had any experience with WPA supplicant prior to Android. So I've, I have seen changes to the source code, but that said, it is in the external directory. So they are, you know, I'm assuming trying to stay as close to the to the upstream as possible. But I'm, I can't tell you specifically the the percentage, if you will, of the code that's affected by you know Android. I do know that there are different versions of it that, you know, different different uh, uh, devices support different versions of WPA something depending on the which, which cards they have or, or drivers they have. Is the reason why they use sockets to communicate from the system server to the other demons, is it because it's just a one-to-one -one connection and not a many-to-one connection like Applications talking to the system server. Yeah, I wonder why they don't use Finder just to talk between the system. Well, because the, so WPS supplicant is a it comes from from Linux already. I think it's dual license, so that's how why we we can use it. And so they it already has this framework for basically uh, um, uh, you know so as a client and a server, oh, if you will. So so rather than re-implementing re the wheel, they're just you know you're, you're using it this way. Sure. Okay. Good. Just to answer this question. So uh, as far as peer to peer device comes down, which some vendors have gone with Right. That's a good point. Okay. So location. Um, let's just quickly go over this. Um, so location basically has a again uh, a service here called location manager service, which is put in you know created by system server. It extends from this stub. Um, which, you know, it's this stuff comes from an AIDL file. And oh, on the other side, we have an activity that wants to talk to a manager. The manager again talks to a proxy, just like we've seen already, nothing too exciting on this side yet. Um, when we say, for example, get last, last known location, what this does, it asks the world which provider we want to, you know, do this for with this GPS network or passive. Um, and it also looks at whether it knows or it has the previous last known location. Um, it then, let's assume we, you, we want GPS, it goes and talks to the GPS location provider, which essentially, uh, first of all, it talk, loads it as a, as a Java class or a Java object, which essentially is, implements the native functionality through this, you know, G, GPS location provider, CPP, which in this case, looks for via lib hardware, not lib hardware, like this, lib hardware, for a component called GPS. Um, and then he has the lib hardware has a specific mechanism that he uses to search for these kind of how components. Some of them are legacy, some of them are kind of the newer, GPS being one of them. And on my Galaxy Nexus, it loads this particular library. That's the first one that he finds. Uh, so Deal opens the library. That library essentially provides the function prototypes that you know they're, they're declared in the GPS.h. Um, and that what that knows how to talk to the actual GPS hardware. In my case, in Galaxy Nexus, it is talking to this particular, you know, that's where the GPS is exposed through. And how it actually works, it's proprietary. I don't actually have access to the source code to this, so I have no clue how it actually um, it, uh, behaves underneath the covers. Um, that said, on Galaxy S for or sorry, Nexus S. Um, you know, there was one extra component. There was a GPS daemon um, that I, I'm not sure exactly what it did in terms of it provided some sort of state, whether it's to make GPS, whether it does ca did caching, whether it made the GPS 
uh, acquire, you know, signal acquisition faster by using, you know, access to the networks and so on and so on. Um, again, that that's the part that was proprietary. Um, I know that it, you know, that was not part of the standard, if you will, but that's what the the, the GPS or the lib GPS, if you will, uh, talk to on Galaxy uh, on on sorry Nexus S. Um, one thing that's interesting about location, though, and this is true for other things like sensors and so on, is that it also works the other way around. So, for example, um, if you subscribe to receive location updates, what you're doing essentially is over here, you're pre passing a reference to some sort of a listener all the way over to this uh, manager service. This manager service can, for example, now use the listener to post updates you know, that it gets from the from GPS, and then the binder call goes the other way around. Now the update is being executed inside of let's say the activity, this you know, the main implement this location listener by a binder thread inside of the client app. So the communication can happen, you know, uh, back and forth, so asynchronously. Go ahead. Yeah, as a VSP developer, uh, at what point am I allowed to change the API? Between the Java API and the, uh, the server.so? So, so you cannot change public API at all and call yourself and call your device an Android compatible device, period. Understood. So um, is libandroidservers.so part of the public API or is that a product to the DSP? So, uh, you, you mean the, what's implemented here? Uh, there. So it's a good question. I don't believe that the CTS or the CDD does, you know, talk about uh, specifically the Android, for example, the lib Android service and what it needs to implement. Uh, it does say, for example, what the, you know, GPS age must stay consistent. So this implementation can be whatever you want to, as long as you're providing the same consistent implementation of the, of the, of the HAL component. But whether, for example, you can go and change this, I believe you can, it probably can. I've not looked at it specifically. Um, let me actually have a few more things to talk about, and we'll run, I don't want to run out of time. So, and then I'll get, answer your questions afterwards. Um, here's one, another one that's a little more complicated. Um, you can see a lot of lines. Um, so, for example, here, what we want to do is, let's say, change the volume or, or on our device, right? There's something in Android called audio policy. Uh, there was actually a talk this morning on, on the um, tiny, tiny also. Uh, no, tiny else is part of what we're going to use. Um, tiny, tiny something, hall. Um, audio hall or something. Uh, that basically, you know, talk, talk, talks about this in, in a little more detail. But anyway, let's assume we want to change the, change the volume. So again, we have activity, talks to the manager, talks to the staff, talks to the driver down below, the binder. Binder goes over here to the, to the audio, sorry, to the um, audio service. Um, that audio service, again, it gets really messy with these lines, so it's kind of hard to follow, so bear with me here. Um, this audio service calls this audio system. This audio system is actually implemented in JNI through audio system to CPP. This, in turn, loads this audio system, uh, which comes from Lib Media, which actually initiates another binder call. Okay, and this call is done in C. Uh, or C++, so it calls this BP Audio policy service, which actually, in, in again, goes and gets a reference to something called audio policy. Uh, so now we go grab a reference to this, or specifically the audio policy service, which extends this. This audio policy service goes and essentially loads a HAL component, a specific, you know, um, um, HAL component, sorry, not yet. Uh, it goes and calls this audio policy manager default, which then loads the HAL component, which in, our, in the case of Galaxy Nexus, loads this tiny ALSA implementation, which is new, essentially it's a, it's a simplified implementation of the ALSA, uh, and specifically in, inside of the mixer C, uh, calls or, or passes through IOCTLs, uh, uh, essentially control to the to this driver to tell it, for example, to adjust the volume. Okay. Now the volume adjustments can be directed for specific um, channels, so you can have volume, you know, for for whatever Bluetooth and the lot speaker and so on and so on. So, but like you see, as you can see here, what's interesting here is that you have actually two binder calls to get to this, and the reason for this is because this is all in the media server, this is in the system server. Um, this one. I'm actually going to leave for last because we are going to run out of time because this, this one is so complicated that I, you know, gave up on, on drawing lines. Um, but let me, let me get to this. Um, let's couple, mention a few more things. 
Um, the telephony is interesting. So telephony is uh, done, again, slightly differently. doesn't involve system server with, with respect to actually talking to the te telephone itself. Instead, what it does, you have this phone app, which um, essentially has this call controller. Um, I don't know why we have two of these. One of these is an extra activity, which talks to this phone utilities, which talks to the phone ma or cl call manager, which does talk to the audio manager, which we actually mentioned in a previous slide, uh, that it could, just, for example, tell the system that you're now in a phone call, so the system knows how to steal focus away from other applications that may even say playing music, which then talks to this phone. Uh, once we talk to the phone, uh, the phone is actually, sorry, implemented by, let's say, a CDMA phone or GSM phone. The G oh, Galaxy Nexus, we have the GSM phone, which actually talks to real. Real is the radio. Um, essentially interface, or specifically real talks to this uh, real D, which is a daemon, the, and the way they communicate is not via binder, but rather through Unix socket. So there's the dev socket real D that essentially we use to exchange messages. Real D is persistent, um, and the reason why it's persistent, why it's not just a simple how, is because we needed to, to, to receive calls from the baseband modem on unsolicited requests, like when there's a phone call coming in. Um, so there's mechanism for us to receive those in here as well as to send out messages. Um, one of the things that RealD does, it actually loads something called the Real uh, LibRail, which in turn looks for a specific library uh, that's, that is essentially a halt. So in my case, it's this vendor lib. Uh, a lib, you know, sec uh, um, library, which in our case again uses a specific driver to to initiate uh, communication with the baseband modem through, you know, AT commands, for example. Um, again, this is mostly proprietary. We don't have access to the driver most of the time, and um, you know, but that's generally how it works. There's this whole audio component to it, which we're not going to, you know, have time to. How does you know the audio fit into this picture? Um, and let me just mention one last one. Um, and then we'll probably be wrapping up. Um, so device policy uh, uh, service. So device policy is what you use to enforce the, or, or use the device uh, administration, which was added in Froyo. Um, so for example, let's say you wanted to initiate a wiping of the device. Okay. Let's say you have you are your application is device policy enabled, so you are a device poli device administrator. Let's say you want to wipe the device. You have an activity that goes and talks to this device policy manager. That again via stub this proxy via the, the you know that it gets from the service manager via the binder talks to basically and this is again gets a little complicated probably more than a little talks to basically this um, let me find it now device policy manager service device policy manager service actually talks to let's say you're doing the wipe command assuming you have the permission for it talks to the recovery system. The recovery system actually schedules, goes over here, and this is hard to see, but it writes to this cache recovery directory that say you want to wipe the, wipe the system. Um, it then goes and schedules a reboot via the power manager. Power manager essentially over here, as you can see, is talks to this power or, or, or is implemented, and this is again a binder, so this power manager is what we talked about previously, which is implemented by a power manager service. So there's actually an internal binder call happening here. Um, this is all still in the same process. This goes and essentially goes back over here to power to initiate a reboot. I should say it talks to this shutdown thread which talks to power to initiate a reboot. The power actually goes and down below somewhere, I can't find the link, uh, talks to, sorry, right here to the power CPP which actually does a system call to initiate a reboot. On reboot, because we wrote this file that we want to initiate and then we also affected something in the in the boot ROM, we basically initially you want to do a recovery. What happens now is the recovery daemon, this is after the reboot, runs, executes this recovery C, this goes and reads for the command, and then based on the command, oh I have four minutes, that's amazing. Um, and then reads from the command and then based on that command goes and essentially executes a um, um, in this case uh, erasing the volume, uh, which then you know talks to the, the MTD and you know erases block by block or just reformats the volume depending on how it's implemented. So what's interesting here is you can see there's again quite a few services involved and this doesn't even touch the whole picture. I mean if I actually had to draw lines for everything you'd be, you know it's already just pretty spaghetti as it is. But ultimately you know this what's interesting is the service call happens after a reboot through the use of recovery. Um, and let me just mention this briefly since I do have I guess three and a half minutes. Um, in this case, audio playback. So again, this is 
somewhat complicated, so I just, you know, just give up on lines. Let's say you wanted to play an audio track. Um, audio track is you do play through something called Media Player. Media Player, you have, I don't know if any of you had a chance to look at the API, but you'll see it has a fairly complicated state machine. Uh, you have to go and call, you know, a, a set data source, then you prepare, and then you actually do the play. And, and each of these calls actually goes through quite, quite deep through the stack. Ultimately, the, uh, what happens here is that this activity may be talking to a media player, which really just implemented to a C code, which talks to an actual proxy to a media player that exists over here. Um, so the JNI is happening on the client side. We're not doing binder in, in, you know, from Java to, to system server or media server. In, in fact, we're doing the binder call from here. So from here into here. So it's kind of, it's, it's not what we've seen before. And again, I couldn't draw lines for binder. This player service actually talks to this media player service, which figures out what sort of a player to get. Let's assume this is a playing a local file. Um, and so now it's looking for a stage right player. What's interesting is that binder supports sending file descriptors from process to process. And even though the file descriptor is not really the same number, if you will, on, on the side of the other, on the other side, it does point to the same physical file and the same offset in that file. So, that's, so when we say play, in, let's say an MP3 file, we're sending a file descriptor to the other side to initiate the playback. We're not sending the raw data, right? We're not copying the data, we're just sending a file descriptor. Now the stage right basically goes, and in this case, let's say, or initiates a, you know, this awesome player, it's an interesting name. This awesome player basically goes and, again, depending on whether we're in a, in a set data source or the prepare or the call, there's different things that happen. But ultimately, what happens inside of this, we're now in the stage, right? What happens is that awesome player builds up this pipeline of, um, if you will, media sources that essentially represent what you want to play. So let me just quickly mention this. Um, ultimately, you know, this pipeline basically works by... I tell you I have two more minutes. Um, this pipeline basically works like this. You have a media extractor, which reads a raw file. Then you have essentially a decoder that actually decodes data from that file. Then you have something, and the decoder is implemented through this OpenMax IL plugins, which vendors can provide. And then you have the actual uh, media player, which is reading essentially one byte, or I should say byte buffer at a time. So it's saying, okay, decode one byte buffer at a time. This goes and says, go and extract one byte, byte buffer at a time. And then this goes and reads one byte buffer at a time from this media source, which could be either a local media source or it could, or it could be like a network media source. Ultimately, this then talks to the audio flinger. Audio flinger, in my case, talks to also this tiny also tiny also talks to the my kernel driver, and you know that's how the media player playback happens. There's also communication to the audio policy to acquire a focus and other things. Um, again, I'd be happy to talk more about it, but unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, so this is you know I'll take any questions offline. But uh, thank you for your attention.